Raphael Signs, a specialist in designing, printing, signage, all vehicle branding, 3D signage and window branding, indoor and outdoor signs. For all your banner designs and print, contact us for a free quotation on the numbers on your screen or email or visit us at 921 Livingstone, Corner 8th Street in Harare. Raphael Signs, our portfolio speaks for itself. First, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, representatives from the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, representatives from uh, traditional leaders, uh, government departments, members of parliament, both in the Senate and the National Assembly here present, members of the diplomatic community, colleagues from civil society, colleagues from the media fraternity, and members of Amnesty International Zimbabwe here present. The call to abol abolish the death penalty is a long-standing flagship global campaign for Amnesty International since 19 1977, when we drafted the Declaration of Stockholm, which called on every government around the world to stop using the death penalty. By then, only 16 countries had abolished the death penalty. As of today, 112 countries are fully abolitionist and 144 in total have abolished the death penalty in law or practice. Amnesty International opposes the death penalty in all circumstances without exemption regardless of the nature of the circumstances of the crime, guilt, innocence or other characteristics of the individual or the method used to carry out the execution. The death penalty is an inhumane and degrading form of punishment that has no place in today's justice delivery system. The death penalty will again come under scrutiny at this year's UN General Assembly. Amnesty International urges all governments, including Zimbabwe, to rally behind the UN's call to end the use of the death penalty in a vital show of commitment to human rights. To conclude, as Amnesty International, we are hopeful that we can work together to rid Zimbabwe of this cruel and inhumane punishment and join the growing number of states, both in Africa and worldwide, who have opted for a more humane, life-affirming approach to justice. I want to invite Rosalina Mzerendi. Rosalina is our campaign's coordinator at Amnesty International Zimbabwe. She's going to take us through the death penalty global campaign, what we do at the uh, global level, and also the history uh, of the death penalty campaign in Zimbabwe. So, Ros, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Lucy. Um, uh, the the anti-death penalty campaign is gaining momentum in Zimbabwe, and we are launching uh, this report at a time when we have been engaging various stakeholders on the death penalty. And uh, let me hasten to say that uh, last week we engaged the portfolio committee on justice, legal, and parliamentary affairs on the death penalty. And today we have another set of parliamentarians. And I believe in that we have got champions within Parliament who are going to help us push the anti death penalty agenda in Zimbabwe. And probably with the 113th country to abolish the death penalty. Hopefully, hopefully, we are just keeping our fingers crossed. So, yeah. So, my presentation, like Lucy has said, I don't know. Can you hear me? <laughs> This thing, Chinoti Kangalisa. Okay, but anyway, um, my, my, my presentation, the word of my presentation is such that I'll share a little bit uh, with, uh, with you the, the death penalty global campaign in Amnesty, where we have come from, and what we've been able to achieve. And then this will be followed by.
friend next to me. I should not cast. I'm not to look at you because I, I want not to be Special rapporteurs on torture, the person whether the death penalty itself violates the prohibition of torture, other ill treatment. But there's been, there hasn't been any final opinion on this matter. However, there is an evolving standard by uh, states and judiciaries where they consider the death penalty to be a, a violation of the prohibition of, prohibition of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. Uh, uh, degrading treatment. This view has uh, found some acceptance in international and regional bodies, but it is not universally shared. It's surprising that it's not universally shared. Maybe it's because of the definition that is limited. I don't know. But last year, the, the, the 2023 uh, theme for International Day Against the Death Penalty was the death penalty and irreversible torture, focusing on how the death penalty constitutes torture or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading punishment. So by virtue of having such a, a theme, uh, that is a theme on the death penalty, that is themed around a uh, uh, torture, it could be that we are now realizing that the death penalty constitutes torture. And when you look at the Convention Against Torture, Zimbabwe has not yet ratified the Convention Against Torture. Maybe it's a conversation for another day. Next one. Next one. Okay. So, still on international instruments, uh, what have you done? What program are you doing? Eh, torture go to ta. Paris na pak. Huh? Under pressure. Uh-huh. Okay. So I was talking about that uh, this year again uh, at the United Nations General Assembly, the death penalty will be up for debate. You may remember that in two thousand and seven the UN Global Assembly came up with what they called the uh, UN Moratorium on the Death Penalty, which was calling for members of the, of the UN to vote for a global uh, moratorium, moratorium resolution on the Death Penalty. Uh, um, so the UN passed the resolution calling upon member states to establish a moratorium on executions with a view of abolishing the death penalty and this voting happens after every two years. So between 2007 and 2022, the United General, uh, the United Nations General Assembly has adopted nine resolutions calling for a global moratorium on capital punishment. So since 2007, 2008, then 2010, 2012, blah 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 blah. The states have been voting for this global moratorium. Next one. And this has been the voting pattern of Zimbabwe at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, since 2007 to 2014, Zimbabwe has been voting against a global moratorium on the death penalty. And then in 2016, Zimbabwe abstained. Hmm? Our, our, our Zimbabwe abstained. And then in 2018, what is happening? Hmm? Send mixed signals. Although local conversations were pointing to abolition. When you look at between uh, 2012 and 2013, that's when we get the new constitution, which reduced the scope of the death penalty in Zimbabwe. But we still went on and voted against a global moratorium on the death penalty, sending mixed signals around the issue. But however, in 2020, in 2020 Zimbabwe abstained. So as in 2022, Zimbabwe also abstained. What is going to happen in 2024, in December, at the UN Global Assembly? Huh? Yes. We need to vote in favor of the UN Global Assembly, UN uh, resolution for a moratorium on the death penalty. Please, I don't know what we can do in our numbers. Maybe just to engage the Minister of Foreign Affairs that as you go to the United Nations, go and represent that Zimbabwe is moving away from the death penalty. Oh, by then, Zimbabwe will never abolish. I don't know, but we are just hopeful. And it's 
So this has been the global part of the, the voting pattern uh, by Zimbabwe between 2007 and 2022. But when you look at this voting pattern, you will see that we have been making progress. Yeah? We have been making progress as a country. We are yet to just agree. And schools are cheating, but I'm going to say, we! And it's like, could you agree to abolish? We seem to be in agreement that you need to abolish. But I'm so sorry, she should be at 20. And it's like, in the world of our parliamentary, this is our picture at the UN Global Assembly. And then, I'm now zeroing in on a regional mechanism that speaks to the death penalty, which is the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And it's like, what are the provisions? Because we are paid to the, to the African Commission and it's by the age of being in Africa. And it, so uh, uh, the article, the, 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 the commission provides for the right to life and integrity of a person for every human being. And it, yeah? Article 4 prohibits a state party from arbitrarily depriving someone of the right to life. And then Article 5.16 prohibits states from undertaking all forms of torture, cruel and or inhuman degrading punishment or treatment. And then the protocol to the African Charter on the Rights of Women, that is the Maputo Protocol that was adopted in, 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 by the African Union in 2003, calls on states not to carry death sentences on pregnant or nursing women. I don't know, Hanku, when you look at the ICCPR, is it of the second official protocol, also speaks of uh, not carrying out executions on pregnant women. Yeah. And then, um, the, and then the, this African Commission also talks about women, and our own constitution talks about women not being uh, executed, and it, or not being sentenced to death. But when you then look at the history, uh, it's, it's a bit, uh, you know, it's unsettling why even historically women were not sentenced to death. The reason will shock you, but I won't, I won't, I won't preempt, I'll talk about it when we reach to that slide, when we are talking about the history of the use of the death penalty. And then African Charter, uh, uh, African Commission on Women and People's uh, Rights, Resolution 136 that was adopted by uh, in, two, uh, in 2008 by the African Commission calls on all state parts to observe a moratorium on executions with the view of abolishing the death penalty. And this year. So when you look at issues to do with the moratorium, Zimbabwe has not executed anyone since 2005. And this year, that was the last execution. But we don't have an official moratorium on the death penalty. We are what is called a de facto moratorium because uh, we haven't executed anyone for more than 10 years now. A sign that we have no appetite to kill. But why are we not removing it from our statutes and challenging you, uh, uh, fellow Zimbabweans? And then we have the declaration of the Continental Conference on the Abolition of the Death Penalty, which is very key, which is called the Konoto Declaration, which was, which was adopted by the, by the Commission in 2014. It calls on legislators in Africa. Huh? Legislators in the room, honorable members in the room, the African Charter is calling on all legislators in Africa to review their national laws and enact a, a legislation abolishing the death penalty. I'm happy to say that something is happening in Zimbabwe. Something is cooking. We have the private members view on the death penalty. So I'm, I'm believing that uh, legislators in the House have, uh, you know, had the call. From, uh, from our, our regional mechanism. And then, in addition, support the ratification of the additional protocol to the African Charter on Women and People's Rights on the abolition of the death penalty in Africa. And it also calls on member states to ratify the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the second optional court protocol, in favor of uh, the UN resolution on a moratorium on the death penalty. So that is our own African Charter. Next slide. So, key for Zimbabwe, the, uh, the African Commission on uh, the, the, the draft protocol to the African Charter on Human, on, uh, on Human and People's Rights on the abolition of the death penalty is key for Zimbabwe and the African region. What does it say? It prohibits the use of the death penalty in all crimes, including terrorism, 
and crimes committed during war. You find that in international law allows for the use of the death penalty during war. Huh? But we have our own regional instrument going over and above international uh, law to say that we need to prohibit the use of the death penalty in all crimes, for all crimes, including terrorism and crimes committed during the war. The prohibition, like I said, is a step ahead of other international statutes which allow the use of the death penalty in times of war. Okay, Chimbofar. So, this is the human rights justification based on uh, regional mechanisms, based on international law. That is so, our justification, our call for abolition is informed by the international statutes uh, that some of which Zimbabwe is ratified and some of which we are to ratify. So for those that we have ratified, as a, as, a, as, a, as a country, we have an obligation to protect, to fulfill Andrika and promote the right to life based on those articles that we have ratified as a country. So that is where we base our argument for the human rights abolition, for the, the human rights argument for the abolition of the just uh, of the death penalty. That is uh, justification number one. I don't know if there are any questions or any reflections. Yes. So I just wanted to find out was uh, the Convention Against Torture part of the discussions of the last week here? Uh, what I remember is that uh, civil society members have been uh, urging the government of Zimbabwe to, to, to ratify the Convention against torture. But uh, and the conversations have been happening, happening at different UPRs over the years. So there has been calls uh, urging uh, the government, but nothing has really, really happened. And uh, in terms of the conversations that happened in the last week here, I'm, I, off the head, I don't remember if the Convention Against Torture was one of the issues that was raised by, uh, was submitted by civil society. I don't know, Lucy. Uh, I think other countries do give uh, the ratification to Zimbabwe as um, they, they give it as a recommendation. Uh, and I think they just note it like, they, they don't they don't take the obligation to do it. So what happens is when they get these recommendations, they can uh, commit to do it, or they can just say we have noted it and we work on it, like not giving a, a commitment. So that's what has been happening. Other countries do give it to Zimbabwe as a recommendation, and they just note it. Um, but the conversations are going on, uh, and even on the sides with civil society, like Rosa said. But other state parties have also recommended Zimbabwe to ratify. Over the years, as Amnesty International in Zimbabwe and across the globe, we have been we have targeted advocacy and campaign based on projects in Africa, uh, Africa, Asia Pacific, America, and Central Asia. What have you been doing there? We have been strengthening national and international standards against the use of the death penalty. We have also been supporting the successful adoption of resolutions on a global moratorium on the death penalty. And I will also get an opportunity to share with you the voting pattern of Zimbabwe at the United Nations Global Assembly. And hopefully, this voting pattern will change uh, this year as we go again to vote uh, on a global moratorium on the death penalty. We have been applying pressure on, on cases that face imminent execution and support actions and the work of the abolitionist movement at national, regional, and global levels. We have also developed uh, advocacy tools to guide organizations that are working on abolition of the uh, death penalty. We also carry out annual researches on global trends and death sentences and executions. And the, the research, that uh, the report that we are, we are launching today is also informed by this research. So since 1977, Amnesty International every year has been uh, um, you know, issuing a report on the use of the death penalty across the globe. So since 19, that's 44 years, right? Is it 44 years? Yes. Yes, it's 44 years. 
And to them, one of the international producers, the death sentence is eight years. They are going to be for 2023. And the, the report usually covers the annual, the annual judicial use of the death penalty based on information that is collected from the state, official figures, judgments, individual sentenced to death, uh, media reports, and even uh, family representatives. The latest is the 2023 Global Report on Death Sentences and Executions, which was launched global on the 29th of May, but we are not we are not yet today. So we launched it a few years ago, a few days ago, um, uh, uh, globally, and in Zimbabwe, because we still have the death penalty, we thought we would use this opportunity to continue the conversations around the death penalty and launch the 2023 uh, uh, global report. So that is our history of working on the death penalty. And key to note is that we mobilize our members globally to write petitions in the case of an imminent uh, 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 execution that is about to happen. We have been successful in other times we have not been successful. But let me hasten to say that we have made a lot progress in regards to stopping imminent executions in, in some parts of the world. And then uh, my next presentation, my ne the next part of my presentation is going to look at the human rights uh, uh, justification for abolition of the death penalty. You may be wondering why, why this organization is so passionate about the abolition agenda. We are so passionate because we know that we are backed by international instruments uh, that are calling for abolition of the death penalty, which is, which is why we advocate for abolition. So in, in terms of the global instruments that I'm going to talk about, I'll first of all talk about the matter of all human rights, that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, how it uh, uh, advocates for abolition through the various provisions. And then this will be followed by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, and then the optional protocol, the second optional protocol to the ICCPR. And then I will zero in on on the African Charter, on the Commission, on African Commission on Human and People's Rights. So these are the instruments that guide or that justify the human rights perspective of the death penalty campaign. So these are, I'll just highlight um, the, the, the various uh, provisions from each of these so that we understand why, as Amnesty, we are campaigning for the uh, abolition of the death penalty from a human rights perspective because we are a human rights organization. So when you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it has got two articles, that is Article, th article 3 and Article 5. These two articles, the, the first article, which is Article 3, that I highlighted on my slide, speaks of the right to life. It recognizes that each and every one of us has the right to life, that is the universal, that is Article 3. And Article 5 prohibits the use of torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatments or punishments. You'll find that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was silent on the death penalty. And it, it was silent on the, on the death penalty. But you'll find that these pro, the, the provisions that are with the provisions 1 and Article 1 and uh, 3 and 5 speak to the right to life and the prohibition uh, from being subjected to torture, to cruel, inhuman, or degrading form of punishment. But however, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a declaration. It was not legally binding. But these provisions were affirmed in the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights of 1966. As you might, as you might recall, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a declaration. But to affirm the provisions, uh, of, of this uh, declare of this very important declaration in the history of human rights, UDHR we call it the mother. It gave birth to twins in 1966. Twin one was the ICCPR, and twin two was the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. But today I'll focus on the ICCPR because it speaks a lot to the issue around the death penalty. You find that the ICCPR is a legally binding instrument, unlike its mother, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It had a worldwide scope, and discussed. Article 6 allows for the use of the death penalty in serious crimes only, but it 
sets up position as the ultimate goal. The ICCPR also says that the death penalty shall not be imposed on pregnant women or for crimes that were committed before the individual turned 18. The ICCPR, which is Article 7 of the ICCPR, also says that the death penalty violates the right to life uh, if it breaches other rights that are under the ICCPR. If it violates the right to a fair trial, then it is violating the right to life. It, is, it violates the prohibition of torture. And then it is a violation of the right to life. That is the International Covenant on the Human Rights of 1966. This is what it says about the death penalty. And one thing to note is that Zimbabwe in 1991 ratified this ICCPR. So what it simply means is that Zimbabwe is an obligation to respect the provisions of the ICCPR by virtue of being a state party to this convention. Next. Okay, and then in came the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that was adopted by the uh, UN Global Assembly in, in, in 1989. Uh, the second optional protocol requires a state party not to carry out executions. And Article uh, two, uh, 1.2 states that all necessary measures to abolish, uh, that state parties should take all necessary measures to abolish the death penalty within its jurisdiction. A state party to this treaty is barred from reintroducing the death penalty. And key to note is that Zimbabwe has not ratified the second optional protocol to the ICCPR. Despite promises in 2012 during the uh, Universal Periodic Review to, um, to ratify the, inter the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So, but when you look at how the progress that we have made as a country with regards to these provisions, although we have not yet ratified, I think when you look at the history of the death penalty in Zimbabwe in terms of progress, we have made big steps towards abolition. And uh, we have not carried out any execution since 2005. And so we can, say, uh, we can safely say, although we are not part to this, uh, it, uh, uh, to this uh, second optional protocol to the ICCPR, we have made steps towards abolition. And I'm believing and hoping that Zimbabwe will join the rest of the world in ratifying the second optional protocol and abolish the death penalty in Zimbabwe. And then the other international instrument that is also linked to the death penalty debate is the Convention Against Torture. The Convention Against Torture that was uh, adopted in 1984 and entered into force in 1987. Maybe, first of all, it, it would be important for us to understand what torture is and see and analyze to see if the death penalty constitutes torture. So I have a definition here on my slide. Torture means intentionally inflicting severe pain or suffering whether physical or mental, on a person. For such purposes as obtaining from him uh, or a third person information, a confirmation, punishing him for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspected to have committed or intimidating or coercing him or a third party. For any reason, based on discrimination of any kind, such pain or suffering is, in, is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent of a public official or other person acting in an official capacity. From this definition, does the death penalty constitute torture? From this definition, from your understanding of the death penalty, does it constitute torture? So I see CPR. Article C saying that it only allows application of uh, the passions only on serious issues. Uh, maybe we can just briefly outline uh, these serious 
uh, issues where the our penalty is applicable. Okay. We want to push as champions of the uh, Amnesty International, and at the same time, I would like to to thank my colleague Honorable Shoriwa for moving the, the, the private uh, bill, and uh, we debated it. I uh, thank you so much because of you. Uh, my contribution is about we need also. Well, at least we are waiting for, we are pushing for the signing and so forth. We need also to come with a motion, which is very powerful. We need also you as a Amnesty International to craft it so that there are some people who are going to, to, to bring uh, petitions. At the same time, us as members will be moving motions. So they will not rest until we reach our destiny. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that uh, submission. And then there was, there was also a question that was directed to the Minister of Justice. Well, would you be able, or maybe you can, you can, would you be able to respond to this uh, one? Yes, um, I, I think... Uh, uh, to move on, you can finish it. Yes, I think she has already touched on it. So mm -hmm. as far as the Minister is concerned, we just noted mm -hmm. um, the the from the last QPR report. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's good. Sorry, sorry. Mm. I think the question is, what is the hold up? What is the issue? Why are we not signing? You know, signing. Okay. Maybe what we can do is, uh, we can leave. We can leave this uh, for the for the reflections. Component. I just thought maybe this part of the of the, of the conversation needed us to to just to reflect. But maybe in terms of the person around foundation against torture. We can then allow the ministry to respond during the main uh, plenary session. And then there was a question around uh, Article 6, which are these serious. So when you look at the, at the, at, uh, at the Constitution of Zimbabwe, it provides for the death penalty in aggravated circumstances, where the courts feel that uh, they are aggravating circumstances uh, that resulted in this matter. I don't know if you see you can add more in terms of serious crimes. So I just make reference to the Constitution of Zimbabwe, which says that in any uh, uh, men only, <laughs> <laughs> those are above the age of 10, 21, and those below the age of 70, can be sentenced to, to death if they committed a murder under aggravating circumstances. Although the, the conversation right now is what are aggravating circumstances. So I'm going on to move on to the next, uh, on to my next uh, uh, part of the presentation, which is going to speak a little bit about the history of the death penalty in Zimbabwe. And when you look at this history, you'll, you'll wonder why we still have the death penalty. Right, so I'll start off with the criminal law. As you are, you are aware, Zimbabwe was colonized by Britain, and obviously we adopted their law. The death penalty was the legal form of punishment there in their country. And the colonialists entrenched their rule with uh, British notions of um, arrest, detention, so, and they replaced the Shona and Jebele customary law. When you look at the Shona and Jebele customary law, then Jebele occasionally occasionally, and according to history, the Debele occasionally uh, sentenced people to death. But uh, as for the Shona, it was never a part of their culture to sentence some to death. But with the progression of time, the Debele uh, people used compensation in cases where a murder has been committed. So you find that the death penalty as a form of punishment was introduced to Zimbabwe by the colonialists. It was never a part of our culture, at least according to history that is recorded. So the death penalty was used to ensure British legal usefulness as part of the pacification process. A criminal punitive measures became an integral aspect of frontier justice during colonialism. The death penalty was a show of power to advance colonial interests by establishing a law and order that will ensure the maintenance of the status quo. So the death penalty was used to maintain the status quo, and the status quo was colonialism. 
and executions occurred when murder was determined to be premeditated, involved extreme violence and peculiar motives and targeted colonial authorities. If the murder was targeted at colonial authorities, uh, it would have shut the death penalty. And then we have other provisions around uh, your question, honorable, around what constitutes extreme crimes. So this is another example. Premeditated involving uh, extreme violence. Mm -hmm. Next slide. How, how did the trial and execution take place before independent Zimbabwe? A trial and execution of the condemned was often done in public before assembled ranks of local community to maximize audience. So it was a public affair. And did you Two fans of Congress. It was a public affair. But there's a chona and did you So that you never even think of rising up against uh, the colonial masters. Executions were by firing squads, and they quickly changed and portrayed Yeni as the most effective, humane, and least violent, acceptable method of executing. I don't know. Is there a humane way to kill? But they then said, okay, firing squad is a bit harsh. Let's use a Yeni. And it's gone. Hanging became popular during the first Chimurenga or Imbukela, 1896 to, uh, to 1897, when nationalism became a potent fragmenter. Uh, you might be aware that during the, 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 the first Chimurenga, it was Kwakuru um, Kumisawa, Kwame Kumarejika, during the first Chimurenga, and they, used to, they, they had to use the death penalty to silence dissenting voices at that time. The first record, although when I was just uh, researching further, this might not have been the first record, but uh, the first record to use was the use of the tree as the, as the gallows. And it was during the Matabele rebellion. A total of nine Matabele men were hung from a tree for looting and for spying. You can imagine being hung from a tree in public for looting and spying. And it got uh, history, however, records that the first known ex death sentences and executions happened before the first Chimrenga, which is the trial of one Louis Andre, who was tried by uh, Leander Star Jameson and four assessors. He was accused of killing a uh, fellow fortune. That was before the first Chimrenga. And another guy by the name Jim Zulu who was convicted of killing his employer, Gadi, wife, child, and Mackenzie, who was Gadi's neighbor. When, when you go back to this tree, the use of the false marula tree, it still sits in the eastern side of uh, um, Joshua and Como Street, previously known as Main Street, between Konot and Masoch. It's, it's still, that tree is still there. It was done to intimidate and put fear in the Ndebele on the outskirts of town. But did, that, did those yangs deter uh, the Ndebele from rising against the colonialists? We'll find out. And I'll, I'll talk more about how, the, how, how people were executed during the colonial times. Early colonial hangings were often improvised affairs. Why were they improvised? Because we never used to kill in our country. So there were no methods of killing, and there were no gallows. Okay, so they were improvised with gallows being created from a nearby tree, or even a door frame suspended over a riverbed. Because Tangati Sina went to improvise. And it's that executions was often gambled by untrained administrative or police officers who were forced to undertake the duty. So when you talk of torture, we do not talk of torture from the perspective of the of the murder victim. We talk of torture from the perspective of that person who is going to carry out the execution. Maybe that explains why we but maybe that explains why you don't end them. Because I think it's just torturous. To be just killing people, to have a job of just killing people. <laughs> and even during that time, police officers were forced to undertake the duty. And it got yeah, this one. Horror stories were told of some condemned inmates having to be hanged twice. And it got others being finished off by a bullet in the head. Others die, dying of an unknown long after being 
hang in a clear demonstration of cruel and human remains degraded functions. And this guy, it has it also happens a lot in America. And this guy, which is the execution is backwards. And this guy, from Apua, you know, lethal injection, yeah. Then the eyes start popping out. And this guy, and then they don't die. Then they will have to, like, you know, put extra efforts to kill them. And this guy, but this was happening. Uh, uh, independence the notable executions during the first Chimurenga was that of Mbiyane Anna, in 1898, together with Wata Guta and Sindoga. These were accused of murdering a native commissioner, Henry Hawkins Pollard. And Kumbore uh, Shumba, Kagui Murenga, was accused of murdering a police officer known as Charlie. And it was done on Charlie. And it was um, there was a specific order that these leaders of the first Chimurenga were privately executed in the then source screen. Right. That was okay. I don't know. Right. 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 Right even when it is premeditated, because they were characterized as having a dullness of intellect and only a childness, childish awareness of their crimes. <laughs> Women in the house. Are you happy with this? This is traumatic. This is the only reason why <laughs> That the majority of earnings in British Africa were being carried out in private, like I highlighted. The processes of execution with time, because by then, with time, Britain uh, to dissolve the penalty, to take off to the extent you the queen actually appealed so that they are not executed. And you look the dynamic, and they were the ones who brought this form of punishment into the country. But when people were about to be hung, there was an international outcry, particularly from the Queen herself, advocating that these people should not be hung. 
What does it say about the death penalty as a form of punishment? And it's got Kwame Wangawa Kuyisa. Who knows what she's saying? This. And it's got um, the processes of execution were, were, were increasingly removed from the public gaze, centralized into a uh, colon's main prison, sanitized by the use of British techniques of hanging. But the guerrilla warfare began to gather momentum. Uh, the government used the death penalty for political crimes, uh, for the prevention and punishment of political uh, dissent, uh, dissent in response to the deteriorating situation. At some point, the liberation struggle gained momentum. And, it, uh, uh, and the colonialists ensured that uh, the, the, the capital punishment became the major form of punishment. An increased use of the capital punishment to silence political activities, not only for criminal offenses such as rape or murder, there was increased use of uh, capital punishments. And then, over and above, uh, other discriminatory tendencies where, where the death penalty was usually applied for those that were fighting for the liberation of this country. Funny I the Black Fair Rule. And it's got funny the Black Fair Rule. Does anybody know what Black Fair Rule was all about? Black Fair Rule. Yeah, Shan is going to okay. Murungu. And it's got a car, a pump car, which is a tema. And it's got I poor a different sentence. What to get? As someone which tema, I can't forget Ziwa. And it's got who's a Arabic pump car, which is a I said it's what to get. That was the Black Fair Rule. And it's got that was the Black Fair Rule during uh, the first, uh, 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 the first jury. And then the law and order maintenance act is Loma and it introduced mandatory death sentence for throwing petrol bombs and possession of arms and harboring perceived terrorists with no provision for judicial discretion or regard of mitigating factors, even when there was no damage to property. And it as you might all be away during the liberation struggle, various techniques were used, and it and one of the key ones was the use of petrol bombs. But no Mayaka Bayatuka can the bomb, where the Papa Munkanata Papis were carpet chet and it got to the gallows. And it got to the gallows. And history records that over 60 executions took place between 1968 and 1976 over a storm of international protest and condemnation by Queen Elizabeth, who attempted to use the royal prerogative of mercy to save three men who were executed. On 6 March 1968. The How many years after independence? Next slide. Like I indicated, from 1972, with the escalation of the liberation struggle, the death penalty was extensively used against guerrilla fighters and alleged accomplices, often after trials that, are, that were conducted in private and it got, or in secret. In 1975, or after 1975, the government, then the Rhodesian government, announced that the names of people sentenced to death or executed would no longer be released. The Rhodesian government also implemented IIT emergency regulations in 1976, creating special courts to try political crimes of alleged terrorism. And it, the extra constitutional courts formed outside the judicial branch had the power to impose the death penalty without appeal <coughs> to the ordinary criminal courts. And it unfair trial to it. And it the special courts tried civilians and imposed death sentences in camera in the regions of the uh, of the country under martial law after 1978. Like I said, uh, the, the death penalty, there was one and it's got one offense that stood out and it's got for petrol bombing, a crime that would result in nothing uh, uh, than inconsequential property damage. I think it was extreme and it's disproportionate to use, to apply the death penalty to somebody who has just thrown a, a, a petrol bomb a, 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 as a symbol of resistance, you know, as a sign of resisting uh, what was happening at that moment in time in history. Next. So in the 1970s, history records that uh, the High Court averaged between 30 uh, death sentences, 
30 to 40 per year, and executions ranged between 24 to 36, and they were carried out uh, annually. Uh, 1983, three years after independence, a death sentence is imposed by the High Court dropped to 15. There were constitutional challenges, but during the first, uh, uh, first six years of the country's independence, uh, uh, this prohibition actually uh, expired. In 1993, the Supreme Court of Zimbabwe declared that prolonged delay on death row constituted a cruel and degrading treatment. It also indicated that it was willing to consider whether hanging constituted a cruel or degrading uh, punishment. The story goes on. We can go and further research. And it post independent Zimbabwe, the government restricted the use of the death penalty in the courts of law, signifying a clear departure from colonial rule. But the fact remains, we still have the death penalty in our statutes. We still have it. And it is a colonial relic. I think you will get an appreciation of how this form of punishment was used there during the colonial era. Huh? That's how it was used. History has recorded that. And we still have it. How many years after independence? So I'm believing that as we launch the death sentences and executions today, one way of honoring those who fought for the liberation of this country is to remove the death penalty from our statutes. Because we are under our career. We are not 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 under our career. What would Lianyanda say if she were to wake up today and find that Zimbabwe still holds on to a colonial relic? Thank you. Comment um, that I really appreciate coming here. And like someone said earlier, that's the background of matters. Because over the week, I had also been doing some research on the countries that kind of have death penalty and the uh, rationalization around that. So I really do appreciate the history. And then for me, it would be, who else are you working with locally to amplify that voice, especially with a strong background that you've just given us? That contextual background is always very important for people to start appreciating because I think for someone who's not in the space and who doesn't understand law, we think of death penalty in the circumstances, in the context that we are at now, but we actually never really get to appreciate the history behind it and what that means even as we live today. And we, we want to make sure that human rights are not violated. So thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the compliment. And just to answer you, to say who are we working with, like uh, when we started, I didn't go in depth about the work of Amnesty International and what we do. But like I said, we are a movement. You can join Amnesty as a member, as an activist, a follower, or a supporter. So we also work with those within Amnesty. So even if you speak to the parliamentary portfolio committee that went around with the bill, they saw some of our activists and our members, they articulate these issues so well. And we also acknowledge the work that is also being done by other CSOs. We have um, Chief Chuota here, he's from Zakro. His organization works with prisoners. They also work uh, on the death penalty. We also have the Legal Resources Foundation. They also work on the death penalty. We also have the Center for Applied Legal Research. They also work on the death penalty. Veritas also work on the death penalty. A lot of organizations that work on human rights also work on the death penalty, doing different things. So, and I also like, I can relate uh, when you say the background matters, because even as a lawyer, before I joined Amnesty, I didn't have this appreciation that I have. And you also find that there are some of the legal arguments that we make that are also not made in the Amnesty spaces. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something, Chekuti, if you give someone the background. So even as we talk to communities about the death penalty, you find someone at Chekuti, ah, if someone rapes a nine-month-old baby, what do you want us to do with that person? They deserve the death penalty. But then you sit them down and say, you know, the criminal courts and codification reform act, together with the constitution and any other statutes, does not even prescribe death penalty for this particular offense that you are angry about. The death penalty has its own history, like Rose Trest, it has um, 
crimes that it is reserved for. So even as you are angry about this rapist that you think deserves the death penalty, the law actually says they cannot get the death penalty. And more shockingly, the one that was reviewed, that if I kill my husband in the most aggravated way, the Constitution says I cannot get the death penalty. <laughs> <laughs> and people don't know about that. People don't know that the, 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 the death penalty is only reserved for men in Zimbabwe. I always joke and say this is the only cause that does not concern us that we are running with as women. <laughs> I'm joking. But if you see us running with it, you'd think we are equally affected. So I, I, I'll, I'll commit the same crime as Richard. But I'm exempted. Richard is going to face the death penalty. Richard can commit a crime that Chief Chiwota will commit. But our constitution has a certain edge that it says men from 21 years to 69 get the death penalty. If you are 21 and below, you don't get the death penalty. Then if you are 70 and above, you don't get the death penalty. But if you see people or hear people talking about the death penalty without this this knowledge, you feel pity for them. I like your facial reaction. The greetings to you all. Uh, let me take the opportunity to thank Amnest uh, for hosting this uh, event. Um, I was just thinking, for some of you that do follow soccer, uh, like some of us, I think many people know names like CR7, um, others know Harant, <laughs> others know Mpape, yeah. others know Vinicius Jr., yeah. and others. <clears throat> yes, <laughs> yeah, in <and> Lionel. <laughs> now, the challenge that normally happens is that. Uh, Whenever Haaland scores for Man City, everybody talks that uh, ah, Haaland scored. But what they don't understand is that uh, Haaland on his own could not have done anything. Yes. The match started with the coach, the management, the goalkeeper, mm -hmm. the, defend, the, the defense, the midfielder, the wingers, they also contributed to the goal. And in this regard, I want to start by reflecting and say that uh, the road to the abolishment of uh, death penalty in Zimbabwe is not a Mushorua thing, but it's a work that has actually been done intensively uh, by Amnesty International and other stakeholders that have actually poured uh, resources, time and effort to educate us and make sure that uh, this process happens. Now, uh, just like uh, strikers normally do, Strikers, by nature, they are opportunistic. <laughs> they, they make sure that if they wait at the right point to actually score, they will allow the midfielder to do the all the work. So what we simply did was to allow uh, Amnesty International, uh, International, uh, Veritas, other stakeholders to do the dribbling. And then we just waited just be before the, 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 the half-line and waited for the ball and then we scored. Now, what did we do? Uh, I will not talk about the reasons why the death penalty is, 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 is bad for this nation. I think that one has actually been covered. Uh, but what we then decided to do, and part of the reason why we then decided to bring a private member's bill. A private member's bill is permitted by law uh, in, in our constitution, section 1 of the schedule 4. It then says that a member can actually bring a private bill as long as the private bill does not touch the question of uh, funding, increase of uh, debt, and other stuff. I thought it was the right time to do a private member's bill because of uh, several reasons. The first thing that I knew was that the current president, Emerson Nangago, was and is against the death penalty. And I think his position, even before he became president, are well uh, known and articulated. Uh, then I also knew that the current minister, Ziambi Ziambi, he had also gone on the international podiums and uh, stated a position that is Zimbabwe, we were in principle against the death penalty. We also knew 
that we, we last executed a, a person way back, more than 15 years ago. But more importantly, I also had the background knowledge. When we did the 2013 constitution, I was an alternative negotiator to uh, the global political agreement. And it happens that even the current president, uh, Emerson Nangagwa, was the, literally the supervisor of Honorable uh, Chinamasa and the, uh, uh, the Shamba men uh, uh, in, in the negotiation. Nicholas Gorge. So what then happened is that when the discussions and the compromise came, initially we wanted to ensure that the death penalty is not included in the new constitution. But many of you are aware that the late uh, president of this country, Bam Gabi, believed so intensely that the death penalty should actually be there. So there was a compromise uh, during the 2018 constitution making to then say no, we are going to exempt anyone who is below 21 years. We are also going to exempt all men that are above 70 years. We are also going to exempt all women from the death penalty. And by the way, the exemption of women was not because of the... <laughs> <laughs> not because they were too in as, as it, it was. But the, the, the rationale of doing that, we were hoping that at another time, that our courts were going to then say, no, 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 the provision of the, the constitution as it is was actually discriminatory. And we had hoped that maybe the court would actually do. And many of you may be aware that from 2013 up to around 2016, we did not have a law uh, that was there. Then it, when the courts, the Supreme Court made the ruling to then find that the High Court has actually made a mistake in uh, sending someone to a death penalty, the government then decided, and the parliament then decided to then enact uh, a law that provided for the death penalty. Now, the constitution is, most of you are aware, section 48, uh, two, uh, section 48 in itself talks about the right of, to life. And then it then says, parliament may, and I want you to underline the word may, and it's not must, it's may. When you say may, it means you may also not do that. So this is the, 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 the issue that we relied on. So there was a, a, a problem in that many people, they said, no, you can't bring the death penalty a abolition bill because it, to do that, we have to co change the constitution. And then the other lawyers then started that and they said, no, 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 no. You don't necessarily need to change the constitution and table the bill first. So uh, I was uh, lucky in that uh, the majority of MPs debated and said, you know, this bill needed to be brought. And I'm actually happy because it was uh, across the political divide. We all agreed. Yes, we then had to do the, the bill. The second part was for the, the, the introduction of the bill. The second part was now to send this bill to PLC, the Parliamentary Legal Committee. And initially, the Parliamentary Legal Committee uh, issued an adverse report, which uh, some of you may know we, uh, we disagreed with. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that the Minister of Justice and the government also disagreed with that uh, finding because there was nothing unconstitutional about the bill. Unfortunately, the POC has now uh, reversed the, the, their adverse opinion. So the bill has now been given a green uh, and a clean bill. And then after that, the next stage is to go to the public uh, hearings. I want to thank Amnesty International and other stakeholders that played a significant role during the public hearings. I attended some of the public hearings, and I can tell you, the overwhelming uh, majority of the people of Zimbabwe said the death penalty should actually go. I wanted to just repeat three reasons that were given. One was, uh, uh, which I think is uh, uh, very important. The first person to murder a person in this world was Cain. He murdered his brother. And by the way, God, when he saw that and said, ah, your brother's blood is actually crying. 
God did not then say, because you have murdered your brother, I am going to kill you. No. So if God did not murder, commit murder, or made Cain to suffer the same punishment that he had committed on his brother, who are we to then push for a death penalty? The second one is the obviously the traditional aspect. We are Africans, we believe in a restorative justice. And then obviously the, 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 the other one is to simply say that he, the current president, E. Jim Nangagwa, survived the death by a whisker on a technical aid. So you always tell the, our political friends to say, ah, imagine if you are supporting death penalty, if, he, if death penalty was there, you wouldn't be having the president, the, the current president in office. So generally, uh, everybody uh, supported it. So we then went to the second reading, because the, the, after you've done that, you come to the second reading. And I want to then say that we did the second reading, and we finished it yesterday. And it was adopted uh, by the whole house. And uh, <clears throat> we are actually moving. What the government has now said, uh, the government then said, look, Mushoriwa, you brought this bill and we support it. But what we now want to do, because the, the government had a, a few challenges with the bill, they, they said, no, the bill was good, but it then also led, a, they wanted to, to bring a provision in this bill of mandatory sentence to simply then say, no, what happens if a, a, we don't want to allow the discretion to judges? So the government then said, you know, we are going to bring some amendments to the, during the third reading, which we are going to the committee stage. And because the government has given an endorsement to this bill, the Minister of Justice has then requested that uh, we co-pilot the bill with the government taking a lead. And I said to, my, to them, look, as far as we are concerned, as far as we want, what we want is that we want the abolition of the death penalty. How it is, it, is, it is done is not important. What is important is that let's do this process. And I'm actually grateful that the Honorable Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, Honorable Zambi Zambi, will be uh, uh, leading the process as we now go to the committee stage, uh, which I believe in, when Parliament meets on the 11th of June, that week we should actually do the committee stage. And thereafter we should actually transmit this bill to Senate. And I'm grateful that we have got senators here uh, who actually who have actually heard the presentation made by the by Amnesty International pertaining to the history of the death penalty, and I hope that when we go to the Senate, and I'm also grateful to the Amnesty International because in the Senate we also do have chiefs, our traditional leaders, and the Amnesty International has done a fantastic job in terms of uh, talking to the traditional leaders, and even when we're talking to the chiefs at Parliament. They are actually grateful that finally this bill is actually uh, before Parliament. So we hope that when we go to the Senate, it will pass. Then after that, we then uh, get this bill before the President for his signature. So I foresee a situation that by the end of June, Zimbabwe will have abolished the death penalty and that will have uh, the death uh, penalty abolition act in Zimbabwe. So it's something that we believe is going to happen, barring a, a major unforeseen circumstance. I have got confidence that Senate will pass the bill. I also have got confidence that the President will sign the bill into, into law. So uh, to that end, uh, I just want to say that uh, this gen uh, of uh, abolishment of the death penalty in Zimbabwe I think it then gives us a, a good standing in the international uh, sphere to be seen as a country that is actually being progressive in moving in the right direction. And I believe we should actually, we should actually do, uh, once we have done that, I think we should also do more. Uh, I, I was listening to the presentation by Amnesty International in respect of uh, some of the uh, international commitments that we are, we, we are not following through and which we needed to do. But uh, be that as it may, I just want to tell you that uh, we are actually on the verge of abolishing death penalty in this country. And by the way, uh, I want to quote uh, Honorable Zambi yesterday. He said that the death penalty 
is not a sentence. It's actually a penalty. Because it, w w w once you are hanged, that's it. There's no comeback. It doesn't matter whether you are innocent or not. Uh, Lucy was saying that in Biani and uh, it was proven that she never killed anyone. But she was young. And that's the, the, the bad part of the death penalty. So to that end, I want to thank you all, uh, Amnesty International, to thank all the stakeholders that have actually contributed. Uh, some contributed from the, for, you know, the activists that were on the ground, some in their offices, to thank the honorable members of parliament that is children and supported this, uh, this bill uh, up to now. And also to thank the executive for having taken it upon themselves to uh, accept a private member's bill. You know, generally, in a, in a country like ours, where our politics is polarized, it's very rare for us as a politicians to agree on something. And it's actually the first of its kind, uh, the, 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 this term, to at least find each other in terms of uh, something that actually uh, brings Zimbabwe together. So to that end, I'm grateful, and uh, I just believe uh, 30 June, we will, no, we will no longer have a death penalty in our statutes. Uh, thank you. It says, Yo, what TV? How could he massive? Slay media TV and this sport and dream with sitting as a one and up a news in that car one run name of views. Slay media TV, man, they change your own dreams. Slay, yeah, we are slay media. 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 Who change your vision? You might get to use. Who change your life? You might get to use. Tipanzira, se maketo yuzi Kutipa gwarara mangwana rakanaka Slaiya uya saimidi